I've brought a little help with me today, I hope. Uh, I've got some video uh, clips, so it's not just me talking um, about my organisation, but just to give you a really brief, before we look at them, a really brief overview. Uh, Eleven years ago, um, as a head teacher, I took my school from special measures, that means failing, to outstanding, using restorative approaches, because it was absolutely central to my vision. Uh, it's still an outstanding school, 11 years later, and it's now part of um, an academy trust of which I am CEO of, containing 11 schools, a teaching school, a teacher training school, um, and uh, associated with a lot of other academy trusts. We provide training and support to other academy trusts. All of our schools in our academy trust are restorative schools. If you are one of the 800 workers that comes to work for us, you have to be a restorative practitioner and committed to that. It's absolutely central to our vision and it drives our values and beliefs and our organisation. The larger organisation, Whole Collaborative Academy Trust, containing these 11 schools, has um, been operating for three years. And in that three years, we've had tremendous results. It's a high-performing trust. Children in our schools make rapid progress. And all of our schools that have been re-inspected by Ofsted have moved up a grade, um, either from requires improvement or special measures to good, and are good schools to outstanding. All of our schools that have been re-inspected have outstanding for behaviour and personal and social development. So I'm really hoping my little film clip works. This is Katie. Katie and Claire, two head teachers in our trust, are going to share with you what restorative practice means to them. I feel that embracing restorative practice in all the aspects in school has been one of the key drivers to the improvement in my school. It, it, it's also made, made a great difference, I think, to uh, me as a leader in that no longer are people coming to me with every issue or question or problem and expecting me to sort it out because it's a shared responsibility to do that. Everyone's views are more carefully considered. There is more respect between people. And people are brave enough, I use that word because I think it's a hard part of restorative practice, brave enough to be able to say what they really think because restorative practice has helped them to give perhaps a tough message or say something that they're unhappy about or have a problem with in a way that's not offensive or likely to cause offence. I think it's helped uh, the school community in, in us having a very common language and understanding of the way that we do business. And so it's a, a shared understanding that we've developed together uh, in how we approach all aspects of the school and its improvement in the community. So there's no hidden agenda with anything, no matter what comes our way, whether it be school improvement or whether it be an issue with a parent or a child or a member the, day, the way that we deal with that will always be the same and that will be a, a restorative way. So you can see from what Katie and Claire said that everything we do, we try to do restoratively. We have schools that come to us in great difficulties. How do we improve them? We Together, we sit with them and plan in a circle for change. We have conflicts. How do we deal with them? We circle up in a restorative circle. How do we build community? We run circles every day. How do we deliver hard messages? We do it restoratively. Plus information sharing, professional development, evaluation and celebration. We do everything in a restorative way. So as we collaborate and learn in our restorative environments, no doubt it makes our children happier, more socially skilled and better achievers. And guess what? It makes our staff 
happier, more socially skilled and better achievers. I want to introduce you now to Katie. She's a, she trained with us and she's a newly qualified teacher who's just coming to the end of her first year of teaching. Coming into the job um, about a year or so ago, I never felt as though the senior members of staff were senior members of staff. We have um, staff circles of the morning um, based teams as well. We also have coaching um, groups. Coaching groups is where a child, usually from each year group, is put um, with a member of staff to form a family in another community. Every member of staff is given that responsibility, you know, as a, a teacher to a caretaker which makes you feel empowered, really, because you have been given that responsibility and you are being allowed to be a restorative practitioner yourself, even though you've been just come to the job a few years ago. The staff are really helpful and friendly, um, but that doesn't just mean that um, you can say hi to them in the street, but you can go to them with any problem that you might feel that you have. Um, it's not something that you get in a room or environment. And I think that was the clear one that went on our training days last year, that it wasn't there in a room or environment. People came to Hollywood and they always used to say that Hollywood was special. Hollywood has something that they didn't have in the schools. And it's difficult for us to say as people within the school, like, what is it that we have? But there's something. What is it that we have but there's something? Creating a restorative community is challenging as a leader. Simple concepts, but hard to do every day. We put children first in our organisation. And as you can imagine, children are the greatest advocates of what we do. So I want you to listen to what the children say about restorative practice. what it's all about so <clears throat> I need to finish my presentation with a sad story um, Phil can you put the next slide up uh, this is Sedalia Sedalia was six years old and on the 29th of April this year this little girl and her mum Zaina were killed outside my school by a lorry <clears throat> The impact on not just the school but the community was devastating. <clears throat> and when I went back into the school to talk about how we were going to cope with this, <clears throat> um, I had a lot of young teachers very, very upset, very distressed, and three other siblings, Sedalia's brothers and sisters in my school. I had to create a plan of how we were all going to come back together and cope. So I just fell back on everything restorative. We started the day after the death with a staff circle. We had 18 counsellors and emotional well-being workers that came from other, other HCAT schools. And from the staff circle, we went into class circles where the children were supported to talk about their feelings. In the afternoon, we opened the school up to the community because I felt there was nowhere else for the community to go. 
we had a book of condolences and we opened the school and we, we ran circles, let people come in and express how they feel. It really moved me, my teachers and everybody who came in because of a very multicultural community. You witnessed my Saudi Arabian fathers, who usually won't even speak to me because I'm a woman, standing shoulder to shoulder with the white working class mothers and weeping. They brought in on their phones translated messages to put in the um, condolence book. And the school and the community raised over £8,000 for the family for the funeral. I think it was a massive litmus test of a restorative school and a restorative community. What could have been a really horrendous day was actually very comforting and healing for a lot of people. I got many, many emails, messages, phone calls after it to say how grateful the community were for this um, ability to come together in a restorative way. So my final message is very simple. In this very challenging and changing world, I think we have a responsibility as educators to make sure that children experience restorative approaches and that schools embrace restorative processes to educate children for today's world. Thanks for listening.